Hello, PPM. My clock says that it is midnight, which means it's time to start the privacy preserving measurement working group session. So thanks everybody for coming. We need a scribe. We need somebody to help us take notes and some brief minutes of this session. And as a reminder, the chairs will start calling on people uh, at random if we if we don't have anybody who can volunteer to help us out with that. So if you can help us out, please let us know. Okay, wonderful. We have a volunteer. Thanks a lot. Uh, can you tell me you, your your username shows as Michael B here? Can you can you uh, identify yourself a little bit more specifically? Uh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, if anybody else wants to help out uh, with minutes or uh, or uh, make improvements and corrections along the way, uh, we do have live collaborative note taking. So. Uh, so, so Ben and Sam, this is Roman who just walked in the room. Sorry, I'm late. Do you need any, if you need anything in room, just kind of holler. I am here. We just got a, a volunteer to do minutes. So I think we're set in the room. Tim, are you ready okay. to go? Actually, no, Ben, you have slides still to run through. Uh, great. So I think we're ready to get started. Let's keep moving. So again, this is the privacy preserving measurement session. I hope you're in the right place. As a reminder, especially if you're new to the IETF, all IETF sessions are covered by the IETF note well. Please familiarize yourself with these policies. They cover both our expectations of professionalism and uh, and communications, appropriate communication style, and also some important legal implications of participating in an IETF working group session. Uh, just a reminder, especially since both chairs are remote at this time, uh, please do use the IETF onsite tool uh, so that we can keep track of who's in the queue and get people their their time to to make comments during the session. Uh, please also note the mask policy if you are on site. And if there are any technical issues or or in room problems, uh, thanks Roman for being present and and being able to help out with those. Please uh, go talk to Roman if if there's an in-room problem. Uh, just a reminder about the general resources in Yokohama. Additionally, I wanted to point out that in this week, there are some upcoming presentations that are very relevant to the topics of this working group made by some of the people you're going to be hearing from today and also some other folks. So if you're interested in learning more about these topics from a different perspective or about helping some of these research groups to understand these topics a little bit better, please do attend the privacy research group and the crypto research group sessions later this week. Uh, this is our proposed agenda. I want to take 
one moment to see if anybody would like to make any comments about this agenda. If there are any changes that people would like to request, otherwise we'll dive right in. Hearing no concerns about this agenda, we're going to move ahead. Next up is Tim uh, for the distributed aggregation protocol with some updates about progress there. Uh, Tim, you can request to share slides and, uh, and drive your own slide deck if that works for you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, there we go, that's my deck. Here. All right, I'm always delighted when this works, but it does work quite reliably. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm one of the editors of the Distributed Aggregation Protocol. Um, and in this in this deck, we're going to discuss uh, what's new since the last PPM working group uh, meeting in the DAP draft and its implementations. All right, but before we can actually get to DAP itself, uh, we need to discuss uh, succinctly what changed in verifiable distributed aggregation functions. Uh, which is the abstraction that DAP is built on top of. Uh, so as, as uh, Benjamin just alluded to, VDAP is being specified in the crypto forum and um, it's received two new drafts since IETF 115. So these new drafts primarily were motivated by a paper that was published earlier this year in which Hannah Davis and her co-authors, uh, which conveniently includes two of the co-authors of VDAP itself, provide a security analysis of VDAP uh, and the two current instantiations of it, which are Prio 3 and Poplar 1. So the paper in question is up on ePrint, and Chris Patton uh, shared a concise summary of the implications of the paper for the protocols to the CFRG list, and both of those are linked on this slide um, and well worth reading. Now, I don't want to get into all of the changes that have happened in VDAF, uh, because this working group, I feel, is primarily interested in the implications uh, of, uh, of the new VDAP drafts for DAP, and also I would get all the subtle points of cryptography wrong anyway. But uh, there is one thing I want to highlight besides the DAP points uh, that I'll talk about in a minute, which is that um, the new VDAP specifies a, a new pseudo random number generator, which is based on SHA-3 uh, instead of AES as before. Uh, so that's fine because SHA-3 is you know, well-regarded, well-standardized cryptography, but it could be interesting for implementations uh, just because implementations of it aren't quite as widely available as SHA-3, but it was necessary to make the security proofs work. All right. Moving on to DAP itself, uh, let's look at the changes. Uh, the first set of changes is those made to catch up with the new VDAP draft. Uh, first off, VDAP 05 now requires the client to randomly generate a nonce when sharding inputs. Uh, DAP addresses this by instructing clients to use the report ID as the nonce. So this should be easy for implementations to deal with since they were already managing the report ID uh, when constructing the report messages. This does mean, however, that um, DAP can now only work with those VDAPs whose nonce length is at most 16 bytes. Or put another way, this might heavily influence future VDAPs uh, to choose 16 byte nonces. Uh, so additionally, uh, VDAP 05 now spells out requirements for how aggregators should negotiate the VDAP verification key. Now the existing requirement is that this verification key must never be revealed to the clients uh, because if they know it, then they can use it to sort of generate bogus reports or forged proofs. But the new requirement that we now have is that the verification key must be committed to by the aggregators before any reports are processed. Um, so the upshot here, there's a number of different ways that uh, aggregators could successfully and securely negotiate a verification key, but it does suffice for, say, the leader to choose it uh, just by sampling a PRNG and then distributing the uh, verification key to helpers. But what this does mean is that the verification key cannot be uh, rotated independently of a task. All right. And finally, uh, now, uh, sorry, uh, what's worth noting is that now, while VDAP and DAP now both include requirements for how to negotiate the verification key, um, task negotiation and how to, how to choose and share the parameters of a task remain out of scope for uh, the DAP document. Uh, and so currently implementations have to work out their own means of securely negotiating these values. Uh, all right, last interesting VDAP change is that there are new rules now for the VDAP aggregation parameter. So the motivation here is really about Poplar 1, uh, which requires that any given level of the tree that gets constructed in the process of aggregation only be queried a single time. So that is, you can only vary the uh, set of candidate string prefixes by going deeper down the tree. 
Um, but the requirements for validity of an aggregation parameter vary based on the VDAF. And so DAP needs a generic way to determine whether some aggregation parameter is valid uh, or permissible given the previous parameters seen for the, um, for the given aggregation. Uh, and so in VDAF 05, uh, there's a new generic method on a VDAF called is valid, um, which allows DAP to do just that. Okay, next uh, we have some purely DAP level changes. So first off, the representation of a collection. So this is the object that gets delivered to a collector at the end of the whole aggregation pipeline. Now includes the interval of time that is spanned by the constituent reports. So this is valuable, particularly in the context of a fixed size task, because otherwise the collector would have no idea what, what span of time um, an aggregation referred to. But even in the time interval query case, this, uh, this interval can be quite interesting because it could be smaller than the interval that was sent in the query. Um, say, you know, perhaps you were doing an aggregation over like a day, but as it turns out, all the reports came in um, only in six hours of that day. Um, it's worth noting, however, that uh, the interval shown uh, delivered in this message still gets padded to the task's time precision parameter in order to protect uh, the privacy of individual contributions. So um, a more uh, drastic change to the protocol uh, was the introduction of the new HTTP API. So the major change here was to hoist a number of parameters out of request bodies and into HTTP request paths, which uh, removes the needs for some really unpleasant parsing hacks and implementations. We also spent a bunch of time thinking about uh, request item potence and robustness of the protocol in the face of transient network failures. So all of this was discussed at length at IETF 115 and even more so on GitHub. Um, so check out the links in the slide uh, to, to all that material if you're interested in seeing all the deliberations that went into that. Okay, next, uh, let's, take, let's talk about some running code as uh, the IETF is so, always so interested in. So first, Libprio RS, uh, is our Rust implementation of the Prio 3 and Poplar 1 VDAF families and the VDAF abstraction. Um, so VDAF 04 is implemented in Prio 0.11 uh, and VDAF 05 uh, is in the uh, Prio 0.12 series crates. Uh, and both of them are available on crates.io right now. Um, so at this stage, we have two different open source uh, working implementations of DAF, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, but uh, they both use uh, Libprio RS to implement uh, VDAFs. So we would really love to see more implementations of VDAF out there. Um, Go would be a really, really good choice uh, for this. Uh, so if you're out there, if you're interested in doing this work or testing it against the Rust implementation, uh, please reach out to us either on the PPM list or uh, I don't know, I suppose anywhere we can be found. Um, we'd love to hear from you. All right, uh, next, Daphne is a, a DAP helper implementation that targets the uh, Cloudflare workers platform. Um, it's DAP04 implementation is currently underway. Um, and as of last week, they are publishing Docker images to a public repository uh, so that everyone can play with them. Giannis is a, a complete DAP04 implementation, modulo any bugs in it, mind you, um, of the client leader helper and collector roles of the DAP protocol. Um, we also have uh, Divi up TS, which is a mostly native TypeScript implementation of just the client role of the DAP protocol. Uh, and finally, Fire, the, the engineering team at uh, uh, Firefox have been working on integrating a DAP client into the browser, um, uh, which is mostly complete, uh, though they're, they, they're catching, excuse me, their DAP before implementation uh, is still underway. Okay, last topic that I'm gonna to cover today is uh, I think pretty exciting, uh, which is that we did a real life interoperability test uh, between uh, Daphne, Firefox and Giannis late last year. So in this test, what we did was to deploy a uh, one DAP task using the uh, Prio 3 sum VDAF, uh, which is uh, as it was defined in DAP 02 and VDAF 03. So this is an aggregation that does exactly what it says. It just sums over a bunch of reports where the measurement is a simple scalar integer. So in this deployment, um, the leader was Giannis, uh, deployed onto Google Cloud Platform, and the helper was Daphne, running in Cloudflare Workers. The client was distributed into Firefox nightly builds um, and only enabled in 1% of nightly installs uh, using Firefox's experiment system. Uh, so we estimated this, this is about 400 clients total. Those clients were set up to report uh, this, the, the sort of fixed value of three every time the browser starts up. So since we know what all the inputs are and we know the number of reporting clients, uh, we can trivially figure out what the expected aggregate is uh, and verify that it worked correctly. Um, and of course, since we're just reporting the static value of three, there's no real privacy concern because the number three 
doesn't reveal anything uh, about any real individuals. Um, okay, so the, the good news is uh, it worked. Uh, we ran aggregations for uh, several weeks. Uh, they ran successfully and we didn't see anything particularly unusual or unpleasant happen. That being said, the scale of the experiment was uh, much too small really to learn very much about performance or scaling. And in any case, uh, neither impl aggregator implementation was expected at that time to scale past more than say dozens of QPS anyway. Um, one interesting thing that we did learn, uh, however, uh, calling back to a previous slide, was that uh, agreeing on task parameters and provisioning them across all the protocol participants is kind of tricky. So for this experiment, we only set up a single task. Uh, and so what we did was just to share base64 encoded blobs of binary uh, using a Google Doc that we all you know, had access to and edited. But as soon as you get to dozens or hundreds of tasks, which is not at all unrealistic for any serious, uh, real realistic usage of telemetry, uh, it's going to become vital for deployments to work out some kind of automated or at least much more foolproof way to negotiate the encryption keys and shared randomness seeds and all the other parameters necessary for this. So once again, this is that that provisioning flow is out of scope of DAP itself, uh, but it might be uh, an interesting challenge, an interesting problem for this working group to take on. All right, to wrap up, uh, I just want to take a look at some of the stuff that's... Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Sam is uh, telling me that uh, Russ has a question. Sure, let's go ahead. Russ, were you in the room? Why don't you keep going? So this is Roman. This is this is Roman from the room. Russ is not here in person, although he is at the meeting in person. Oh, oh, that's odd. Right, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I think I'll just wrap up since this is my last slide, and I'm happy, Russ. I'm happy to talk to you about if this was a real question at, at any point. Okay, where was I? Oh, right, yeah. So I just want to talk about some of the future goals uh, for the DAP draft stuff that might be coming up in DAP05 or later ones. Um, so the next big thing, area of focus, is going to be Poplar 1. Uh, so VDAF in particular has been doing tons of work to make Poplar 1 scalable. Uh, and once we have some more success deploying Prio 3, uh, we're going to need to wire Poplar 1 into our DAP implementations and kick the tires on it, see if there are performance or other problems that wind up um, you know, feeding back uh, in the form of changes to, to DAP itself. Uh, further, the draft text itself needs a lot of work um, for simplicity and just to clarify things. So personally, I'm interested in cutting as much of it as we possibly can, uh, eliminating things like error codes or other features that aren't essential for the protocol to function. Um, though, of course, we, uh, we don't want to say prevent implementations from providing rich diagnostic information in various cases if they wish. Um, I also, uh, we've known for a long time now that the text could be, uh, the, the text itself could be clarified and we really should be putting in uh, more visuals like block diagrams or sequence diagrams that better illustrate this relatively complex protocol. Um, additionally, a future draft will have to, in conjunction with VDAF, include some language around how to deal with central differential privacy. So this would be applying some differential privacy noise to aggregate shares, um, which, uh, unlike local differential privacy, that has to be in, you know has to be dealt with by the protocol. Um, next, the, the security consideration section is well out of date at this point and needs a, a lot of work to be brought in line with the current state of the document. Um, uh, another thing that we've been chewing on is whether we should uh, consider decoupling the aggregation parameter, which can be quite large, from aggregation jobs. Um, there's some detailed, this is somewhat detailed topic that we don't have time to get into here, but there's a linked uh, issue there if you're interested in it. Um, and uh, I encourage anybody who, uh, everyone to take a look at that discussion and weigh in if you uh, have something to say about it. Uh, and finally, uh, the editors have been pondering whether or not uh, DAP should specialize to exactly one aggregator, uh, which is going to be the main thrust of the, the very next talk by Brandon and Chris. So I'll let them uh, introduce that problem in detail. Um, okay, that's it for me. Thanks everyone. Everybody in queue, any questions for Tim before we move on? Thank you, Tim. Chris, Brandon, I don't know which of you is taking this first. Hello, hello. Uh, am I on? 
You're on. You're you're you're, you're faint. So hold the microphone close. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm not driving the slides. I'm starting, and then Brandon is going to finish. Uh, could the chairs drive the slides? Can you put the mic close to your mouth? Yeah. How's that? Is it on? I'm trying to get on. It's not on. It's it's on, but maybe take it out and hold it close to your mouth on your finger. I think I just turned it on. Now I hear myself. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, or, all right, PPM. Um, okay. Um, so everyone can hear me, right? Am I good online? Okay, I'm going to assume I am. Okay, so um, as Tim alluded to, uh, this is going to be about a, uh, an idea for a change to the DAP spec um, that we are thinking about from an implementation perspective primarily. We would like to see if we can reduce some of the latency that we've noticed during the aggregation flow. Um, yeah, uh, so let's, let's get started. Next slide. So um, a quick overview of how the aggregation flow works today. So just as a reminder, this is the part of the protocol where we um, take our report shares, decrypt them, uh, process them, do input validation, and then eventually commit them to long-term long aggregate storage. Um, so I'm going to go through the current flow. Um, and to illustrate, well, let's think of pre 3 in particular. So the salient details of pre 3 are in this green box on the slide. Um, so in the aggregation flow, what we're doing is um, each aggregator, the leader and helper, have an input share. They derive from this input share a value that uh, we call the verifier share. And then we combine these uh, verifier shares into a message that we call the verifier. And this is what we use to de decide validity. So uh, what we do in the, um, there's two HTTP requests over the network for Prio3. Um, for le the leader in its request sends along the, in the, uh, the helper's input share, just, and this is encrypted uh, to, the, to the helper um, by the client that uploaded it. The helper uh, replies with its verifier share, and then the leader locally combines its verifier share with the helpers and uh, responds to the helper uh, with the verifier message in the next request. Next slide. So um, the nice thing about this in this flow and really the, the, the thing that we envision for it is that it's uh, quite natural, naturally extends to VDAFs that involve multiple helpers. So um, the, the, we, basically what the leader is doing is emulating a broadcast channel. So um, it will send each helper its input share, um, gather the responses, which are the, uh, the verifier shares. And then in the next round, it broadcasts the verifier message to the helpers. And then um, at that point, everyone can commit um, their share of the input to aggregate storage. Next slide. So um, the thing I want you to notice about this flow is that it, it inherently requires at least two round trips over the network. Um, if we think about just the two aggregator kind of model, um, there's actually a nice optimization we can do. Um, so what the, we, the leader can do is along with its, uh, the helper's encrypted input share, it could also generate and send its, the leader's verifier share. That way the helper computes the verifier message and commits, sends the verifier message back to the leader, and then uh, the leader commits a second. Uh, next slide. So the upside of this is uh, less round trips over the networks, which means reduced latency and also uh, less of a chance for uh, network issues to impact uh, the aggregation uh, protocol, which is the heaviest weight part of, of, of DAP. Uh, concretely, for pre 3 we would have one request instead of two. For Poplar 1, right now we have three requests. This change would mean we would have just two. Um, and of course, the downside is loss of generality because we are now in a world where uh, we have two aggregators and we can't really generalize, generalize uh, to, to uh, multiple helpers. So the question basically we have for the working group um, what we would like a decision on in the near future is should we continue to support this uh, multiple helpers or are we comfortable at this point specializing to a one helper protocol? 
So we've uh, we've done our best to get feedback from people on the mailing list and other menus on, venues on this question. Um, and uh, so I'm going to I'm going to go through some of the the, the considerations uh, in the next few slides, and then I'll turn it over to Brandon, who will um, go go through um, the our actual proposal, and then uh, we'll kick it back to the chairs, and they can tell us what we uh, what we might do next. Next slide. Okay, so uh, as I said, the main consideration here is generality, and there are a few use cases that uh, have come up so far that are uh, potentially relevant here. Now, the main one is basically, um, if you have more aggregators, then you end up with a weaker trust model, because for a protocol like Prio, it's very nat it very naturally generalizes to multiple aggregators, and to get privacy, you only need to trust one of those aggregators, to be honest. So um, that's the kind of beauty of this uh, extension to multiple helpers. It's important to note here, though, that not all VDAFs are necessarily generalizable in this way. Um, Poplar 1, in particular, is only defined for two aggregators. Um, and we don't know how to extend it to more than two aggregators, at least right now. The second uh, kind of use case for multiple helpers is um, a robustness in the presence of a misbehaving aggregator. So as a reminder, um, we have privacy if uh, some of the aggregators are cheating. Um, but we don't have robustness. That is the ability to detect and, uh, uh, and, and filter out invalid inputs. Um, so to get this property, uh, there's, there's a couple of papers that looked at how to do this. Um, I don't think that this is compatible with the current broadcast ar architecture we have for DAP today. So I think to support these techniques that get robustness uh, this stronger robustness property, we would have to change the architecture. Basically, the problem is the leader is still, if the leader is like sort of, you know, emulating this broadcast channel or, you know, or mediating communication between, between two helpers, there's still lots of opportunities for it to misbehave. Um, the third thing that's been brought up is that there might be VDAFs that require uh, at least three aggregators to meet their security goals. Um, I don't think we have examples of this yet, but this is a possibility. And then lastly, um, there are other MPC architectures um, other than VDAFs that would require three or more aggregators. A good example is um, IPA, uh, the sorting scheme in that in that protocol. Go to uh, PERG, is that what we pronounce it? PERG, okay. PERG, thank you. Um, okay, and um, so, uh, you know, maybe we wanna shoehorn that into DAP, maybe not. I don't know if we've settled that question. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, before you do that. Yeah. I thought Plasma had three aggregators. It does. Uh, it's the, the second citation there on, um, it's uh, 2023-080. I guess I don't understand what you mean when you say we don't have three um, so the, uh, the, uh, yeah, Plasma does this thing where um, it's basically running a two aggregator VDAF three times among each pair of aggregators. And um, we can do this. Um, I don't know if it works with our architecture, at least not with trusting, without trusting the leader a little bit more than the helpers. Okay, I'm not sure I'm following you. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, mean, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is it would be undesirable if we made a change and cost an optimal response. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if that's true or not, but that, that seems like it. I mean, I guess. My point is that this, this sort of presents as a hypothetical question, but it's not because it's a real, it's a real thing that needs to be aggregators. Uh -huh. So if this doesn't break plasma, then cool. But if it does break plasma, yeah, then that's we're having trouble hearing that microphone remotely. Would you make sure it's it might not be on? How about that? That sounds good. So yeah. should I repeat myself, um, or are we just going to be done? I, I'd like to have you repeat yourself because I couldn't understand you. Right. So as I understand it. Plasma requires three aggregators, and so what Chris and I were discussing was whether this change would break Plasma. And so what? I, and so what? I, what I, that, that was my question. And then my, my statement was: if this doesn't, if this breaks Plasma, then that seems bad. And if it doesn't break Plasma, then maybe it's okay. So it, it, it sort of depends on what you mean by Plasma. <laughs> so um, Plasma is uh, essentially it has um, at its core is a two aggregator VDAF that is uh, exactly like Poplar but better. And um, the way they achieve malicious robustness is basically this trick um, that, that has similar features with um, 
uh, well, both of these papers basically do the same thing, where you're running the VDAF uh, three times among each pair of aggregators, and basically you vote on what is the result. There is a downside to this approach. You do, uh, you do have robustness in the presence of one malicious aggregator. However, you only have privacy in the presence of one malicious aggregator. If you have two mal malicious aggregators, they can actually collude and break privacy. So it's not a win in terms of privacy, it's only a win in terms of robustness. But this is like, you know, yeah, a point that needs discussion. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think like, I'm still not quite following what the answer to my question is, but um, uh, maybe we can- I don't, so your question was, does this, break, uh, does this break plasma? I would argue that it doesn't. I don't think that the, the, feature, the, the, the feature that we want from, there's, there's two things we want from plasma. One is the improvement uh, compared to Poplar, and then the other one would be robustness in the presence of a misbehaving aggregator. I think this has a downside the way they do this, and we need to figure out if that downside is worth, um, if, if the trade-off is correct. Well, I guess, I, guess, I, I guess I don't actually like, right, so I think, I, I, I mean, as I just skimmed the plasma discussion, right? The story of plasma was that you needed the three, you needed three, three aggregators in order to even get the privacy objective, right? No. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a version, of, there's, uh, there's the, the thing they call VIDPF. This is basically Poplar, but better. Okay. And it has the same security properties. Because At least it, it claims the same nothing security Nothing Design has robustness in the favor, in, the, in place of one malicious aggregator. Yeah, nothing we have right now. So I don't think that's, I don't think that's important, but I thought I'd understood that Plasma required it even for privacy, because that's not correct then. No. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I mean, yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, Ecker. Um, uh, I, yeah, we, I, we can talk more about, about it offline or um, in, in a little bit. Um, I'll blast through the next three slides. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so jet loss of generality, that's the main consideration about this change. Um, the, another consideration is complexity. So this, this current spec is pretty complex. Um, a lot of, part of this at least has to do with um, the generality that we have, multiple rounds, multiple, aggrega uh, multiple aggregators. Um, this I'm a little worried is, is, is maybe impeding adoption. Um, I think we have some un unspecified behavior in the current draft. I can talk about specifically what I think is underspecified. Um, we need to solve this in any case. Um, it might be easier if, uh, if we make this change. I don't know. Um, next slide. Uh, and then, of course, there's the state of current deployments. We have some open source implementations. We've had this Firefox nightly experiment. Um, uh, but otherwise, you know, we haven't, um, I mean, we do have to update code, and we need to decide if this is if this is uh, this change is too big at this time. Um, uh, I, the deployments are pretty limited, so I'm, I'm I think I'm less worried about that personally. Uh, but another angle that has been brought up uh, on the on the mailing list about this issue, um, you know, more deployment experience might actually tell us if this if this change is warranted. We didn't observe any issues in our very small scale deployment, but uh, we were sort of anticipating um, having issues, and and hence hence the 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 the, uh, the desire to make this change. Next slide. Uh, and I'll just say quickly, I think this uh, this question gets at the scope of the the DAP spec itself. Um, there's an argument to me made basically to ship what we want to deploy right now and think about generalizations later on. Uh, now I'll hand it on to Brandon, who will go over um, the uh, proposal. Go ahead, Brandon. Uh, next slide, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Brandon, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about the a uh, specific uh, design change that we're proposing uh, that uh, requires one helper DAP, and especially the performance enhancement that is uh, enabled by specifying to one helper. Uh, so kind of the core insight uh, to one helper DAP uh, is that in current DAP, the leader is in a uh, privileged position in terms of communication. Uh, not only does the leader uh, drive the aggregation process in the sense that it uh, initiates all of the network round trips, but it is also effectively the center of a star communication uh, uh, layout, uh, which means that it is sort of the central piece of a broadcast hub uh, and therefore is the aggregator that effectively must merge verifier shares uh, into a verifier. Uh, in one helper DAP, 
uh, the leader, while it still drives the uh, network communication uh, in terms of starting network round trips, is no longer in a privileged position. Either the leader or the helper can easily broadcast to all of the aggregators because there are only two aggregators. So point-to-point -point communication is the same as broadcast communication. Uh, so a VDAF evaluation uh, requires that all of the aggregators start with an input share, which they can then derive their initial verifier shares from. Uh, all of the verifier shares can be merged into a verifier, uh, and then each aggregator can use the verifier to derive uh, its next, uh, the verifier share for the next round, except the last round where the, uh, met, where the verifier is used to derive the output share. Uh, and retrieving the output shares is the goal of the aggregation protocol. Uh, so the core insight is that the total count and order of the VDAP operations is not changed by this, uh, by this uh, proposal, but the total number of network round trips to complete aggregation is reduced by about half. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this table uh, compares the current DAP specification to the one helper uh, DAP specification. Uh, the main change is in what is transmitted with each uh, round of DAP. Uh, so in current DAP, uh, the leader transmits uh, an input share on the first round or a verifier on the sub uh, subsequent rounds. Uh, and the helper always uses what it receives to uh, derive its own verifier share, which it then transmits back to the leader. Uh, the total number of network round trips is rounds plus one, where rounds is a parameter of the VDAF. Uh, the reason the number of round trips is rounds plus one is that, uh, so rounds, uh, network round trips are required to perform the actual VDAF uh, evaluation, and one round trip is used to uh, essentially transmit the input shares. Um, in one helper DAP, uh, the core change is that with each network round trip, the helper derives not only uh, its verifier share, but also the next verifier. Uh, so in the initial round, the leader transmits uh, not only the helper's encrypted input share, but also the verifier share that it derives from its own input share. The helper derives the verifier uh, from the two verifier shares, and then immediately uses that verifier to compute its own next verifier share, which it then transmits back. Uh, in subsequent rounds, the leader computes the verifier from the next verifier share and its own uh, verifier share, uh, and then immediately computes its own next verifier share from the verifier uh, that it derived and transmits both. The helper uh, does Similarly, it derives its verifier share from the verifier it receives, uh, computes a verifier from the leader and helper verifier shares, and then immediately computes its next verifier share and transmits both back. Uh, the number of network round trips is rounds plus one over two uh, rounded up or ceiling. Um, and the reason that it takes this number of round trips is that uh, in the one helper DAP proposal, uh, each network round trip effectively steps the underlying VDAP twice rather than once. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I want to walk through a couple of example VDAP uh, evaluations using both current DAP and one helper DAP. Uh, the first example I want to walk through is a one round VDAP. Uh, for example, uh, PreO3 is a one round VDAP, although there's nothing PreO3 specific about this example. Uh, so looking to the current DAP uh, communication sequence diagram, uh, to perform aggregation, uh, the leader in, uh, sends a message to the helper containing the helper's encrypted input share. The helper decrypts this input share uh, and then uses the input share to derive uh, its first verifier share, helper verifier share zero, which it returns to the leader. The leader, uh, during this time has decrypted its own leader input share um, and has derived its leader verifier share zero uh, from its leader input share. Uh, and then it uses the leader and helper verifier share zero to uh, compute verifier zero. Uh, it then transmits verifier zero to the helper. The helper uh, attempts to use this to retrieve its next uh, verifier share, but since this is uh, a one round VDAF, 
Uh, instead, the helper receives its output share and has completed the aggregation protocol. Uh, it sends a message back to the leader saying that it is finished. Uh, and the leader uses verifier zero uh, to compute its own output share as well. And both the leader and the helper have uh, retrieved their output shares and the protocol evaluation is complete. Uh, in one helper dApp, uh, instead of sending only the uh, helper's input share, the leader also derives its own verifier share zero from, uh, from its own input share and transmits both the helper input share and the leader verifier share zero to the helper. The helper uh, uses uh, the helper input share to derive uh, its own verifier share zero, uses the leader and helper verifier share zero to compute verifier zero, uh, and then attempts to step forward from verifier zero, but receives an output share. Uh, because it is complete, it sends a finished message back to the leader. Uh, the leader uses the verifier zero that's transmitted as part of the finished message to uh, retrieve its own output share and the uh, aggregation evaluation is complete. Uh, so the number of network round trips is reduced from two to one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for one more example, uh, for a two round VDAF, uh, for example, Poplar one, uh, but again, there's nothing special about Poplar one. This is a generic uh, VDAF evaluation example. Uh, the current DAP is very similar to the uh, previous slide, uh, except with an additional network round trip. Uh, so with each round, uh, so in the first round, the leader sends a help, uh, helper input share, the helper derives the verifier share and sends it back. Uh, and then the leader uh, computes a verifier, sends it to the helper, the helper uses that verifier to compute the next verifier share. Uh, this continues for two rounds instead of one, uh, at which point the helper completes. Um, set, and then the leader also completes and the evaluation in, of, the, uh, of the aggregation is complete. Uh, and this takes three network round trips. Uh, for one helper DAP, the leader, uh, just like in the previous example in its initial message, sends the helper input share as well as the leader's verifier share zero, which it has derived. Uh, the helper uh, derives helper verifier share zero from the helper input share, uses the leader and helper verifier share zero to compute uh, verifier zero, uses verifier zero to compute helper verifier share one and sends both verifier zero and helper verifier share one back to the leader. Uh, the leader uses verifier zero to compute leader verifier share one uses helper and leader verifier share once to compute verifier one, sends verifier one to the helper. The helper uses verifier one to compute the, uh, attempts to use verifier one to compute the next verifier share, but since this is the final round, uh, instead retrieves its output share and realizes it has completed evaluation of the VDAF. Uh, it sends a finished message back. The leader during this uh, also uses verifier one to retrieve its own output share. Uh, and both the leader and the helper have retrieved their output shares and the evaluation is complete. Uh, this takes two network round trips. Uh, the reduction is from three to two in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in summary, uh, we need as a working group to decide if we want to support uh, an arbitrary number of helpers or to specialize the helper uh, the protocol to one helper. Uh, the main pitch for specializing to one helper uh, is that we can reduce the number of network round trips in the aggregation flow by about half, which uh, we believe to be an important performance enhancement. Uh, it also, there are several other considerations. Um, generality, um, we may lose some things that could possibly be specified as a VDAF uh, if DAP only supports one helper. Uh, complexity, uh, specifying one helper simplifies the protocol. Um, while there are some, arguably some uh, low level technical increases in complexity in the sense that the aggregation protocol is doing more work per step. Um, we need to consider current deployments. This is a fairly large change to the protocol. Uh, we need to decide if this is too late uh, in the game for us to change, uh, to make a change of this magnitude. Uh, and then we also need to consider uh, the scope of the DAP draft. Do we want DAP to support every possible uh, underlying VDAF or thing that could be expressed as a VDAF, uh, or are we happy specifying only one helper? 
uh, thank you. That's all for me. There was some interesting discussion in the Zula chat. Martin or Ecker or anybody else, do you want to get in the queue and continue that? Go ahead, Ecker. Well, I think first I have a clarifying question, which is, has anybody measured the performance impact of this? Because it sort of, I sort of assume there's quite a bit of processing. This. I mean, these are like fast machines on low latency networks. And I assume there's a fair amount of processing that happens when you do these steps. So like, just approximately speaking, how many CPU seconds are run on each round trip? Brandon, you want to take that? So I can't speak to the uh, like a specific quantity of CPU seconds that's taken per network round trip. Uh, what I can say is that uh, the total number of underlying VDAF operations is the same, although the distribution of which aggregator is performing those VDAF operations uh, has changed somewhat with this proposal. Um, so as, as I mentioned, the leader was previously uh, performing all of the um, combinations of verifier shares into verifiers. Uh, with, with this proposed change, the leader and the helper would effectively be sharing uh, or taking turns merging the verifier shares into verifiers. So I would expect that the total number of uh, CPU seconds or other uh, resource usage metrics would not change, although the distribution of which servers or machines or deployments are performing the work uh, would shift somewhat more towards the helper. Sure, this is an Ambrose law question. Um, namely, like these are fast machines which have like fast links between them, which means that the round trip time is something probably in the order of like 20 milliseconds. And so if you're running five seconds of computation and you're shaved off 20 milliseconds, you got to have a lot of round trips where it makes a difference. So I'm asking what's the max of like the total, total time in the system, how much that is spent on network round trips? So um, I think, I mean, I don't think that we have good data on that right well, how now. Long, okay, well, how long, what is, what is the time for the, what is the total end to end time of the computation typically? So um, on Cloudflare workers, it takes about like, Cloudflare workers is slow for this because we're using WASM. Sure. Um, so it takes maybe for like a couple hundred reports, it takes like a second to process. And then the second request is much faster. Um, so like finishing is j just the initial processing step takes time. Right. Um, so, so it sounds like you're getting performance edge about 5%, maybe on the high end. Um, I mean, yeah, it depends on the network, I guess. Uh, cause like, you know, the, sure. Yeah. Just, just less round trips. Like the, our thinking is less, less round trips over the network, the better, um, you know, latency being a consideration, but also just kind of complexity of the protocol. Cause you have to keep state, but across these requests. Well, I'm, I'm, right, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work through the pitch here, right? Yeah. The number of pitches, right. And so like, it seems to be the headline pitch here is this is faster. And so I'm asking how much faster. And yeah, I, I don't think we know. So I think like that, I think like if that's the motivation for this, I think really like we need some numbers. Um, okay. Especially because like, I mean, like I would imagine that things are gonna get bigger, not smaller in terms of the number of reports you have to evaluate, right? So, um, uh, I mean, I'm like not like, I guess, I don't like really feels wrong with this, but I'm just trying to break down like the, like the argument here. And mm -hmm. so it seems like what we're proposing is to give up some flexibility in the future in favor of some simplicity now. Yes. And so, like, that's like an aesthetic choice um, at some, some level, right? I'm not, not aesthetic, but it's like a, it's like a full, full stack level architectural choice. Um, but I think that this is a much weaker story if the performance is if it's not really a performance win. And so, like, I think, I think like, you know, would I be arguing for like the opposite if, like, if you were proposing to go the other direction? I don't know. But, like, um, you know, I think like if the primary argument for this is performance, and mm -hmm. if I told you it was going to do it faster, we just don't want to do this. And if the answer is no, then we shouldn't do it. And if the answer, and, if the, and um, unless unless you can actually prove it a lot faster, right? Um, uh -huh. If the answer is even with exactly the same t time speed, you still want to do it, then like let's discuss that that aspect of it. Okay, I'll tell you what. Maybe we can like prototype it and and talk about it like mm -hmm. and and just you know figure out like from like our actual deployment if it's going to be faster. And I think, I mean, I think you could do that, but I think you could just guesstimate it, right? Like I say, yeah. Um, I mean, like I'm happy to send an email and like what well, that measurement I would take, but I think you could, I can get this from existing data, right? Yeah. Um, well, so you're like, I mean, it's sort of the numbers are like, um, you have reports per aggregation job. Yeah. And then you have the number of aggregation jobs you're running simultaneously. Um, and so the more aggregation jobs you're running simultaneously, the lower the overall latency of, of aggregating the entire batch. So it kind of depends on how much you scale, like how much how much this impacts. I, I don't think I follow, but anyway, um, 
like I say, I think the, the things pushing in favor of this, I think, are the argument simpler, which I think is 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 a reasonable argument. Okay. Things pushing against it are, are it's like less less general. And this goes to my question about plasma as well, right? If there's no anticipated reason why we'd ever need this three thing, yeah, then like cool, and like maybe not do it, but like, maybe take stick it out. But if like if we think on the horizon we want we want three, then like we're really sorry we didn't we took it out. So I think like you know, and so I think if if it's like if it's like a sort of Yagni versus like future proofing kind of discussion, as Martin would probably have it, versus a, you know, um, versus a performance discussion, there's a different discussion, I think. Okay, thank you, Ecker. Yeah. I will add that the, um, some of the load testing that we have done uh, internally has, has shown that a single server can handle something like a thousand QPS of reports of uh, pre-03 sum. And again, this is gonna be heavily dependent on the underlying VDAF. But um, I would suspect that the CPU cost of evaluating some beat apps is going to be fairly low compared to the network round trip, especially for, uh, for aggregations transiting the public internet. Yeah, Martin Thompson, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the generality question here, because I think um, the, the current structure of DAP is, is such that you've already made the decision to, to throw certain pieces of generality outside um, by the nature of the system. It's a star arrangement. Yeah. Um, if, if we're going to put something like IPA in this thing, we wouldn't want to have uh, a leader in, in that situation, or you wouldn't, would want to have helpers talking to each other directly because the communication there essentially runs in a ring. Yeah. Um, so we're already in a situation where we're building something that is, is fit for purpose and Closer fit for the um, for the Poplar and and, and Prio um, designs that you have specifically. Mm -hmm. So, um, I I think when you when you think about it in that context, the generality question as an advantage of the current design looks a lot less like an advantage and more like a, a deliberate choice that was made in order to facilitate a particular type of deployment in the future. That I'm not sure I anticipate anyone ever ever doing. Uh, we we have all of these systems that, are, that do MPC with you know hundreds of different participants and, and people doing research on, on scaling out to that, that sort of thing. I just don't see that happening in this case because all you're doing in a lot of those cases is just like increasing your exposure. So um, I, I, I think this, this idea that DAP is entirely generic is, is more appealing than, um, than it is a, a practical use for the deployment of the protocols that we actually care about doing. Hey, um, Siobhan Saheb. I was just wondering, you had a pretty helpful issue some time ago about talking about like ingress costs and egress costs that um, you were envisioning. Do you, like, it seemed like this would help with those costs as well. Is that right? No? Um, I think you're transmitting the same number of bits, but you are, you know, um, yeah, I think you're transmitting the same number of bits. I guess less requests helps mm -hmm. with, I don't. I actually don't know if that would help with cost, like like money costs, mm -hmm. um, but that's a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, from my point of view, I think that would be an interesting thing to see yeah, if it does actually lead to cost savings or projected cost savings. Um, I think the other thing was, um, yeah, like the fact that it leads to less complexity and, um, yeah, mainly that it leads to less complexity seems like like a good thing. So um, so yeah, I'm supportive of that. Hi, Ben Schwartz, uh, not there. I wonder if you have thoughts on how this change would impact the naturalness of the HTTP API, which I know is very subjective, but uh, in the HTTP API, if you think of it as a REST API, um, in my experience, often when you start trying to add performance optimizations to these kinds of systems, you, you end up having to move away from clear semantics uh, in your HTTP invocations. Um, like I requested a thing and you sent it back to me versus like I'm requesting a thing, but I'm also sending you a component and you're going to then do some kind of complicated operation and send me back part of something else. If we start, are you merging operations in a way that makes them harder to conceptually model or or is it actually just simpler to understand um, yeah. the 
single helper case? I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I is Tim, or Tim, do you want to give a shot at answering? Tim G? Yeah, I think I can. Um, yes, yeah, so to your point, Ben, like I spent a lot of time on the new HTTP API for DAP, and I was trying to do the whole REST thing. And what I learned is that, uh, yeah, like trying to stick to those semantics, you, you, as you just put it quite well, uh, often you end up being, like, a lot of time it's not worth it, especially when we're talking about something like this, where we don't expect like a browser to be able to go do DAP stuff, right? So we, we, we expect that anything that's doing DAP will be a server or a client that was written specifically with DAP in mind. So I think we've got to be cautious about like how precious we get about sticking to like rest uh, semantics and so on. Um, that being said, uh, okay, your question about like how would this change affect the semantics of the HTTP API? It's not that bad actually. Um, and in fact, you can see a draft uh, proposal of the changes that Brandon put together. Uh, I think, or hopefully it's linked somewhere in these slides. If not, um, if not, I would invite everybody to go look at the a draft IETF PPM DAP repository on GitHub is just one of the small number of open pull requests on a repository at the moment. Um, yeah, but changes to the wire messages, it's not that significant, really. Um, so I don't think it meddles with the, uh, the rest semantics of the whole thing too much. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I got into the queue for a different reason, mind you, which was to uh, respond to Siobhan's question about uh, egress costs. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I said, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, so for a quick bit of context, like what, the reason we're talking about this is because uh, public clouds uh, are happy to have you upload data into them, but then charge you a lot of money to move data out of their networks. Um, so this is a, a concern that was raised early on in DAP. Okay, uh, let's see. Chris pointed out already that uh, there wouldn't be, yeah, the total amount of data that moves around with or without this change doesn't, th th that should make a difference. What you will see though, is that um, in the current draft, it's the leader's job to broadcast combined verifier messages uh, out to all the helpers. So it's the leader that has to eat all the egress costs. Now in this model, you would have the, uh, the leader and helper take turns sending the combined verifier message which essentially means that the egress costs would be shared across the two aggregators. Maybe we feel that, maybe that's more fair. That's one way to look at it. Um, and last thing to say on egress costs, if we, uh, it's still something we're, you know, we're thinking about. And actually, maybe I should have mentioned this in like stuff that's coming to the draft earlier. If we wanted to do something about that, the big thing to address is the size of the report shares themselves. Like the big thing is that the leader has to transmit to the helper the report shares uh, sort of in band in the aggregation sub protocol. So the way to ameliorate that would be to have, well, one way to ameliorate that rather would be to have clients upload report shares directly to either aggregator. Um, but that bring, that has some complicated implications that we haven't thought through. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Um, thanks for the discussion on this. I appreciate it. I will speak for Ben and say that he does too. Um, I hope that you all got the input that you need there. Um, I certainly think I got some input that I needed. Um, and I think we're going to move on to STAR. Um, Sophia is going to start with some performance measurements and um, then we're going to talk about the draft itself. Um, hang on Sophia, a second. Ready? Be before, we do, before we do that, like, how are we going to proceed here? This actually has to get decided. Preferably Editors, I, I, I think I heard some, a rough consensus in here, but are you happy proposing to the list a path, a path forward? And absent objection, we move forward with that? Tim? Someone say something. <laughs> it's, okay. It sounds to me like the thing to do, uh, as Ecker pointed out us earlier, is to take some measurements. That'll uh, better help us decide whether this change is, uh, is worth the trade-off or not. So I think the okay. next action here would be for, say, like our team and, and, um, and Chris Patton's team um, to go implement this proposal and experiment with it and come to the working group with some concrete measurements of, like, how is it faster, what's the difference in bytes transferred, that sort of thing. For what it's worth, I'd be happy if you just bench ballpark that based on some data we already have. 
Um, but it seems to me that the main argument here is not performance, despite the way it was presented, but rather Yagni, right? Simple protocol simplicity. Yeah. So I think if you think, the, I guess, I guess, what I, like, like if you think this is worth doing based on that alone, then we should move forward. And if you don't think it's worth doing based on that alone, let's talk about how to measure. I think it's worth uh, doing. I do as well. I, I just wanted to note that we're we're about to see a presentation that actually does put some numbers to some of the the CPU performance costs related to DAP. So uh, hopefully we can we can be informed by that presentation. Maybe that will will give well, those us will be the most pessimistic numbers to, though, to, to to make but those, those are the most pessimistic numbers for the poplar, not not pre -L. So. Those will, uh, those will underestimate the benefit of this technique. Uh, I, I guess yeah, like, I'm just under, like, under this is a working group yeah. item. This is, it's a working group item and we need to, and we need to get it, get it, keep it moving. And so like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to move on in this presentation until we've established what it is that we're going to do like this. So if I'm not, you're going to sit down if you want, but like, like we need to keep this document moving. And so like, how do we, how do we finish this? So, Echo, you're saying you're fine with ballpark performance numbers? I, if if the authors and the people in this room feel like this is worth doing, even without, even if it not, was not any faster, then we should do it, and we should move forward. And I, I can live with that. So, if they don't think it's worth doing, then we should take the performance numbers. So, either we should say it's worth doing, and we should just do it, and, and you know, have a call on the list and say we're going to do it, or we should say it's not worth doing without performance, and we should take the numbers. So, but I hope people thought it was worth doing even without performance, and so I think we should move forward with that. Hi, this is Roman as AD. I was just going to jump in. I heard that this was getting pitched in two different kind of ways. There was the, this isn't a database, data-driven kind of thing. We just get a lot of simplicity and implicitly simplicity will be good. And we're going to, we're going to get that. And then I also heard, and there may be some performance uh, kind of benefit. We don't have our arms around it, but it may or may not be better. There's the offer to kind of get numbers, but everyone I heard come up to the mic said they're probably good on just the simplicity uh, kind of uh, kind of argument. I think Martin, you've got a set of best. Uh, you know, let's just let's continue to grind into it being fit to uh, fit for kind of purpose. So if that's what I heard in the room, one way to kind of do this is let's just go back to the main list, give it another week to say let's double check, uh, no objections, and if there are no objections, we we kind of roll this way. That works for me. Thank you, Chris. Are you still needing to say something? No. Okay, basically just that. Um, thanks for the discussion, Ecker. Thank you for pushing us to get to resolution. Sophia, go right ahead. Okay, um, Sam, can you share the slides yourself? All right, or do I have to do it? Not, I don't know. Okay. Just a moment, it'll be right up. There it is. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, okay. So my name is Sofia Sely, and I'm a cryptography researcher at Brave. And today, I basically wanted to present you the beginning of our research work that we're currently undertaking, which topic is different. But because of that, we also perform some measurements on the two schemes that have been of interest of the working group, as far as I know, which is the popular scheme that was just uh, mentioned previously in many of the talks, and also the STAR scheme. And if you want to learn more about those measurements, I actually put together a bigger version of this presentation uh, in the form of a PDF that can be found in the URL of this slide. Next slide, please. Okay, just a little bit to set the scene, let's look at some of the notation, and this is the notation that is going to be used either to the star scheme or to the popular scheme. On the first one, because the star is a k-threshold aggregation scheme, you will have, obviously, a k, which is going to determine the threshold, which in terms of what I have been reading in the drafts currently uh, in, uh, on the path of a standardization at this working group, is the size of the subset of the different batches that you send to a, either a collision observer or a single server. You also have N, which is the total amount of shares that you secret share something to. 
You have C, which is the coalition of clients that are going to be sending uh, an X amount of measurements to a coalition of servers or to a single server. You have S, which is the aggregation server, or the randomness servers that only exist in a star, not in popular. Uh, M, which is the message that you want to secret share. In this case, the specific measurement that you want to send as a client to an aggregation of servers. T, which is an integer that belongs to the natural numbers that states in the popular scheme that a string sigma appears in a list, in a list that can be defined as A8, 1 to A to the C, more than T times. Sigma, which is the string, the string that you want to uh, find in that, in that list, and L, which is the size of that string. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was just basically to set the scene and maybe to, uh, to give you a little bit of a background about the scene, uh, the scheme of the star scheme specifically. I'm going to talk about more the star scheme because that might be not so familiar for the people here in this working room, while I think that the popular scheme might be more familiar to people in this room. So just to little bit clarify what the star scheme is, basically the star scheme is a K threshold aggregation scheme, which means that if you receive uh, K uh, measurements, uh, a batch of case size of those measurements, you're only able to reveal those measurements that meet that specific threshold and not anything else that doesn't meet that threshold. And there you prefer, preserve uh, some level of privacy of individual client measurements. So in SCAR, we're basically using um, uh, three um, specific algorithms. We're using a secret sharing algorithm, a randomness algorithm, a deterministic release generator randomness algorithm, and an encryption algorithm that performs all of the um, functionality that we need. So in the start, basically, each client constructs a ciphertext by encrypting their measurement and any auxiliary data using an encryption key that was derived deterministically from the randomness. Um, the client then sends the ciphertext, a k out of n secret share of that randomness, and a deterministic tag that informs the server how to aggregate them. Once the server receives them all, what it does is that it aggregates them in batches of k size and only recovers um, whatever measurements belong to those specific k size. Next slide, please. Okay, and maybe let's just visualize this because maybe that will put uh, down to where some of the things that I have just spoken a little bit more clearly. So the first thing is that I said that what you are going to do as a client is that you're going to be sending a measurement to a specific server. And then what you're going to do um, is that you, so what you do in a star is basically with that measurement, you're going to derive deterministically some randomness. This can be done by the usage of an OPR server, or you can also do it locally by using hash functions or AES in CTR mode to derive deterministically randomness. There's many ways in cryptography that you can do that. But basically what you get after this process is that you get a value that we're going to be uh, labeling it as RI. Once you have that specifically randomness value that was again derived deterministic from the specific measurement that a specific client holds, what you're going to do is that you're going to pass it in three paths. R1, R2, and R3. From R1, you're basically going to derive a deterministic symmetric key that is going to be used to encrypt a ciphertext that we're going to be calling, sorry, uh, CI. And then you're also going to um, think that that R1 is going to be the secret, um, the secret that you're going to secret share. So use a secret sharing algorithm to secret share R1 into different N amount of shares. Um, for that secret sharing algorithm as local randomness, you basically use the value that you also derive that is called R2. Once you have all of that, you have your share, you have your ciphertext, and you have your symmetry key, what you're going to do as a client is that you're going to construct a message basically by doing a concatenation of the ciphertext, then the share, and then of the stack value that is basically just the last third value that you derive from the randomness, so R3. And happy you go, you send that as a client to a server. Next slide, please. Once the server receives a lot of these messages from different clients, what they're going to do is that they're going to group them together in batches of case size. And how you're going to sort them is that you're going to look at the specific tag of that message, the R3 value, as you remember, and you're going to put them in a specific uh, batches of case size in which all of them have the same tag. Once you have them um, basically laid out in some nice batches, what you're going to do is run the recovery algorithm on that specific shares of those messages to recover R1, which is later going to be used in, uh, to derive the symmetry key and therefore be able to decrypt the message that uh, each specific message from the client had. And in that way, what you're going to do is basically reveal only the measurements um, that belong to that specific, K, uh, that specific batch of K size. And that's all. So next slide, please. 
And as you see, this is a very simple scheme. We basically have very simple, boring cryptography. I'm a cryptographer, and this is like a very boring, if you think about it from that point of view, we have very boring cryptography because we basically have a deterministic randomness generation algorithm that, as I say, can be an OPRA, but can also be a hash. It can also be AES-based. You then you have a very simple secret sharing scheme, and then you have a sorting algorithm and also an encryption algorithm, and you're ready to go. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the initial paper uh, that David Song et al. Uh, proposed uh, and was published in ACM CCS, they performed some measurements and they actually they showed that the scheme is very efficient because again, it's using really boring cryptography that is implemented in many operating systems uh, and different systems in general. So it's really easy to mount. And as you see here, they, they are the initial measurements that it really performs well. This is like, please. Yes, um, but there was one problem that I'm going to put in the next slide. So first, let's just start looking at the secret sharing algorithm. So right now, basically what the STAR protocol basically defined to use as a secret sharing algorithm is one that we, we have called in cryptographic terms as a depth secret sharing. And the original paper is also listed here if you're ever interested in reading about it. And it basically consists of two functionality, a share generation and a secret recovery. A shared generation, you basically get this secret message, and in our case, it's going to be a client measurement. And you basically, what you do is that you generate an amount of shares with uh, an instruction internally that determines that, um, that they belong only to a specific K threshold. And this uh, procedure takes uh, O of M, um, depending um, on the M byte uh, message. Secret recovery is basically is going to happen is that you will be giving yourself a K amount of shares and then you're able to uh, launch the recovery mechanism that it also has the same time or the same complexity, time complexity as the share generation. The scheme and the original paper, if you read about it, um, has certain security and privacy properties such as authenticity and also some level of privacy, but, and it also can be expanded to perform a thing that is called error correction. So what it is error correction is that if you have a set of case size of different shares, and let's say that one of those shares was corrupted because indeed you can corrupt it, um, then that algorithm should be able to point, pinpoint exactly which share was corrupted, recover from that corruption and move along. Um, unfortunately, as it's stated in the paper, um, that error correction algorithm uh, has in a worst case a time complexity of two to the end. So it's not so fast. Next slide, please. Okay, and because of that, as it was pointed out in the mailing list of this working group, there can be a specific attack, which is basically this attack of actually having malicious shares and malicious client. So let's say that you're a malicious client and you want to somehow destroy the scheme, then what you will do is that you are going to create some corrupted shares and that you're going to be sending them to the aggregation server. The aggregation server is going to take these shares. They will not be able to actually pinpoint which one of them was corrupted. And therefore, all of the batch of case size or even a batch of N size is going to be discarded because you're not able to pinpoint exactly which share was corrupted and therefore discarded. You will have to discard the whole set. Um, so this gives the possibility, as you see, of actually performing a DOS attack because you are basically denying um, the service of actually being able to recover the correct measurements. Next slide, please. But there are solutions. So one of the solutions I already highlighted, one of the first ones is actually use the same secret sharing scheme as the initial SR protocol uh, defined, but also perform error, error correction. But as I, as I already said, maybe this is not so efficient because you will have to perform end to the uh, two, I think, operations. I don't remember exactly, but you can check the paper. Or what you can also do is that you can also use a secret sharing scheme that has verifiability. There's many of them. One of the most popular is the Feldman scheme and the Pedersen scheme, but there are many, many of them. There's a vast literature about uh, verifiability and secret sharing. In this case, we have only uh, focused on Feldman's scheme because it's the most simple ones. It works over polynomials, so it's really simple to implement as well. Um, but there's other uh, candidates in the literature. What you can also do is that there's other constructions that you can use that you don't have to use any kind of commitments or poly polynomials or any kind of proofs, but rather you can use other computer science structures to arrive to error corrections. And right now we have a publication under review that indeed arrives to these two og log of n times. But in this case, let's just focus on the second solution. So next slide, please. Hi. 
Hi. Uh, before we go to the next slide, I just want to know. Ah, okay. <laughs> we set, you got it. Uh, a timer here to make sure that we get to the uh, next part of the yeah. discussion about STAR. So uh, you, you may not be able to hit every point in your slides. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. <laughs> Okay, um, so basically, as I said, you can achieve variability with this Feldman scheme. And you basically, what you do is that you have uh, this uh, secret sharing creation algorithm that what it's going to do is not only going to create this N amount of shares, but it's also going to create with them a set of commitments. And those commitments is basically a proof stating that each share was created correctly. Um, unfortunately, you will have to create a case size of those commitments. So the recover, so the secret sharing algorithm is really fast because you will have to only create these n shares and also this set of k commitments. Um, but the verification algorithm could be considered not so efficient because you will have to verify on each one of the shares that are presented to you. You will have to verify that the, that set of k commitments is valid. So you will have to iterate in that set set of size k to actually verify um, that they are correct. Next slide, please. Okay, so we actually uh, sat down and actually thought about the worst case complexity, average case complexity, and best time complexity of this algorithm. If it's worst time complexity, it happens if, for example, you receive an amount of shares in a size of k, in a set of k size, and the malicious share is at the end. Then, of course, you will have to iterate and perform k operation for each one of the shares until you reach the end of the array, the end of the set. Therefore, you have a worst case complexity of OK times uh, the size of whatever set. You have an average case complexity that is difficult to define because for an average case complexity, you will have to determine what is the possibilities on an attacker to first corrupt the shares and also to control the network in such a way that they arrive in a specific order. And in the best kind of complexity is the contrary of the worst times complexity because if the malicious share is at the beginning of the subset, then you're ready to go. You only have to verify one share. Next slide, please. Okay, so now for the maybe interesting part of this uh, talk. So what measurements we actually did? We, we actually implemented, and I know that the ITF like, loves uh, running code. So we actually have running code of the secret sharing algorithm with this verifiability scheme that is called Feldman's. We implemented it in Rust in the latest version of, of Rust at the time of the speaking. And we also implemented it, and we implemented it in the operating system of Apple with an Apple M1 Mac chip. Um, and we also implemented it with two curves, with curve 2519 with the restraint encoding, and also with a curve that is called SEC256K1 that is popular because it's used in some blockchain applications. And we found out that, next slide please. It actually performs uh, relatively well. In this case, I'm showing the, perfor uh, the performance numbers for the specific curve, the FFR19 curve. But as you see here, that if I, sh if I send a report size of uh, 1,280 and the threshold is 128, then it will perform in five seconds the complete uh, verification and recovery procedure when using this specific curve. Next slide, please. But if you're using a curve that is indeed more efficient, a sec 256 k one which is 30% more efficient than the curve to FFR19, you arrive to the same specific parameter, two times or 2.05 seconds. So what we see here is that the scheme is dependent on two things, the size of K and the underlying field that you're using. Either this could be your final field if you're using the Fiedman or the elliptic curve that you're using. This is like please. And here in actually graphs, you can see how the scheme grows proportionally in the size of K. So the X axis um, represents the, the size of K, and then the Y axis represents uh, the time in seconds. And we see here that when we increase the N amount of shares to recover, they still grow proportionally. You see the times growing linearly proportionally on the size of K. Next slide, please. But again, this also does not only depend on, K, on the size of K, but also on the specific uh, curve that you're going to be using. So we see here that if we compare curve 2519 with uh, sec 256K, obviously the curve that is faster is going to be arriving to much more faster times because um, again, you're using the curve operation in a much more faster way. Next slide, like, please. Okay, so basically that shows that this is indeed, this is an efficient scheme. You would have to actually turn in a correct way the K parameter and also perhaps use a finite field or a curve 
or underlying curve that is fast as well. But we can also think even a little bit further and also think about what will be of actually creating a smart verification algorithm. So the verification procedure right now that I benchmark it basically runs every time that you present them uh, an amount of shares. But what if we, for example, actually define an algorithm for a star in which that uh, first you actually uh, execute the recovery procedure and then in only then if it fails, then you perform the, verifi the verification procedure, which means that you will not have to be executing this a little bit more timely consuming verification, but rather when it actually fails the recovery, then and only if you perform a uh, verification. So in that way, we're actually creating something more sm smarter and a smarter algorithm. Next slide, please. Okay, because... Come again? Do we want questions about these measurements now or later? I prefer later, but I okay. don't know. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And the other scheme that is of interest of this working group, as you know, is Popra. I'm going to just go very fast on this, um, which uses distributed pump functions, as you all know here. Uh, but the scheme, instead of being dependent on the k value as it was with the star, it is dependent on n on l, sorry, which is the length in bit of the of whatever message you're trying to find out uh, the most uh, common values of. Next slide, please. We did exactly the same. We also benchmarked it in ROS by using the actual implementation from the original paper by Bonnet et al. Um, but one of the problems that we found out is that um, that specific implementation was in an older version on Rust, and also that version of Rust only compiled on a specific older version of the Apple system. So maybe these ben benchmarks are not that accurate because of that, because we had to use some environment that was a little bit older. So bear that in mind. And what we actually was more interested in this case was to actually see how the scheme behave if we increase the size of the string that we are going to be searching for. So we use both 256 and also 512 bit strings. We couldn't increase much more the string because the code um, segmented, full segmented when we tried to increase the size of the string. Um, but if we use another implementation that could be easily benchmarked. Next slide, please. Okay, and what you see here is that if we're actually using a threshold here that represents that more than 0.1% clients hold in a specific string, where have two times uh, that are a little bit bigger when compared to a star, um, when you increase also the size of the input of the specific string that you're going to be using, you arrive also to much more uh, longer times. But I will argue later on the final conclusions that this, this is not so bad as it's seen here. Next slide, please. And again, what we see here is what already the time complexity of the algorithm is telling us. I already told you that it's dependent on L, on the string size. Therefore, you will see that, that when we increase actually the size of the string, then the algorithm increases as well. Next slide, please. Okay, and then just for conclusions. So the conclusions are basically that the star with a specific verifiability algorithm seems to be efficient for a specific values of K that can be bigger than 10 because probably for useful purposes, you don't want a K that is smaller than that. And it's also smaller than 128 approximately, which in general, in, uh, from the real world, it seems to be useful in practice. I asked a lot of implementers of k threshold anonymity schemes, and they all told me that this, those are actually useful values in practice. And it's also efficient depending on the final field or the curve that you use. So if you use uh, 256 K1, it's going to be much more faster than if you use curve performance. Um, the performance on Poplar, on the contrary, is sensitive to the L, uh, to, to L, which is the size of the string that you're searching for. But uh, indeed, Poplar performs better with the star uh, BS when given, for example, a large percent of malicious clients, or when you have a large values of the K value. But again, it is difficult to actually compare these schemes and put them side by side because both of them rely on different board, in different cryptography and also because they behave differently. So in Poplar, for example, you have the computational times plus the communicational times of the service because they speak to each other. While in a star, you most of the time only have the, the computational size from the service size. So comparing them side by side is a little bit like comparing apples with oranges, um, but at least we can take some individual measurements of them all. Next slide, please. Yes, um, we have future work. Um, so the idea will be to actually measure the whole system of a star with BSS instead of only measuring with the specific verification part of the algorithm. 
But there's probably not much difference because the boring cryptography that gets added on the star is extremely efficient, so it will not have an impact at all. We would like to update the code base of Poplar to actually perform measurements with a um, newer version of Rust. But uh, as Chris Patton uh, rightfully pointed out on the mailing list the other day, there's already an implementation of Poplar on Libprio, so we probably can just take that and benchmark. Um, we will also like to formalize this verification algorithm. I'm a cryptographer and I'm a little annoying in that way. So um, if we're going to introduce verification uh, into STAR, we should also use the same security formalization of the scheme in the original paper and introduce verifiability and see that all of the security and privacy properties hold. And we should also formalize and eventually present to this working group uh, the scheme that we're currently doing of error correction that arrives to all local end. So ongoing research and engineering work. And with that, I think that's the final slide. Thank you, oh, Sophia. Thank you, and that's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to get to, this, to the discussion of whether or not to finally bring this into the working group as a working group draft. But if there are questions ah. about, go ahead, Ecker. Yeah. So, yeah. do you have? Yeah. So I'm trying to get a sense of like what the the real world complexity of this algorithm is. So you described the verification complexity. But that's, that effectively is the complexity in the best case scenario where there's, where there's no problems. So do you have measurements, do you have simulations or, or, or closed form computations where say 5% of the, of, of, the, of the reports are randomly damaged? So right now we don't have that, but I know that at Brave there's currently some effort to actually put it in deployment. So there we can actually measure. And I agree that that will be actually really good. Um, also because uh, on this scheme, I have only presented the computation as complexity from the mm -hmm. service side, but it will be good to see also see the communication and complexity plus the other one. So yes, I like sure. that. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I don't think we need to have it in, in, in the field to answer this question, right? It's just a simple question of how many times, how many verification passes you have to run at given taint rates, right? Um, so I think that's a pretty straightforward, a pretty, pretty straightforward to Monte Carlo, something other side like that. But um, I mean, I think, I guess it would be very helpful. I think I understand it's hard to compare the apple to apples to apples. It'd be very helpful to see some candidate parameters and like curves for the performance of each of these th things if we're trying to make decisions on performance. Seeing no other questions, let's move on. I think it's time for your okay, side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Sophia. I request you to share slides. I think I should be able to do it on my phone. Uh, okay, let's see. Then you should have control. Cool, thanks. Uh, um, hey all, I'm Siobhan. Um, I've done a version of this presentation in the past, um, so this should be fairly quick. and We can get to the main part, which is questions. Oh, thanks, Roman. <laughs> Uh, cool. um, yeah, as uh, Sophia mentioned and went into way more depth, um, the idea with STAR is to use K anonymity for, for clients um, reporting measurements to a server. Um, and uh, the goals are it should be cheap, um, simple, and private. And like the idea here is that the client should be able to verify that. Um, and in STAR, you, the client can actually verify that the the, like verify the k that k value that's being used, so it's not um, it's not hidden from the client. So you, the server can't just be like yeah k equals one, and just um, this, the client doesn't have to trust the server about that. Um, I think this is yeah kind of a repeat of what I said. A client wants to send a certain telemetry value to the server, and um, but only wants the server to see if there are at least k uh, values that look the same. Um, there's a bunch of implementations at this point. Um, it's shipping in the Brave browser. There's, um, uh, there's a few also different variants. Um, there was the original one, which was just using regular Shamir secret sharing. Um, there was the verifiable one that Sophia talked about with benchmarks. Uh, and Chris Wood also did um, the verifiable implementation and Go well, also with benchmarks. And there's a WASM bindings. So there's, a, there's quite a few implementations at this point. And yeah, I mean, I think we're thinking about, given the various attacks that were brought up uh, and discussed pretty extensively over the last year or so um, on the PPM mailing list, we, the authors have like made several changes and um, 
kind of like done a lot of like legwork around figuring out how we can mitigate those. And at this point, I think there's like various trade-offs uh, around measurement and I mean performance and um, yeah, complexity and uh, what what like you know what threats you mitigate. So kind of put that in a table here, but um, I think. Uh, the idea is that there's like kind of two axes that you can uh, like move around. Like there's a secret sharing scheme, like there's the regular one, and there's a verifiable one. Um, and there's also the signature scheme or protocol. And that and classically in the paper, uh, we worked with OPRFs, but you can also use RSA blind signatures, which is a thing that Chris Wood, um, Chris Wood's idea. And I think it's it helps with one of the attacks, uh, which is the bad ciphertext attack. Um, so I think yeah, that's we haven't really explored this too much in the draft, but I think. Um, that is something in the next draft. I think version would be good to good to nail down, and that's about it. I think um, there seems to be interest in Star from what I've seen, and we've like worked with the working group on getting it to a place where I think everyone's uh, specific like threat models were addressed. I think at this point, so yeah, I think from my point of view, and I think from the author's point of view, we should just work out like the remaining stuff in the working group. So um, yeah, I think we'd just like to ask for a call for adoption. I think that's my last slide. Uh, and yeah, I think happy to take any comments and questions about that. Chris? How do you blind signatures help with uh, the bad ciphertext problem? Yeah, so I think the idea is that you are then encrypting the uh, the signature itself as well when you're sending it to the server. And then when you decrypt it on the server, once you reach a certain K, then you get the signature and then you can verify that. Um, I, that is my understanding. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of like just, it was just an idea that we had. Um, and yeah, I think it's worth exploring that uh, or like putting that formally down in the draft. Martin? I realize we keep coming up with problems. Um, here and, and that's good. Um, that's, I guess, part of why we do this. But yeah. um, the basic shape of the protocol is that some number of people will submit a value um, to the system, and you won't be able to query the system until at least k people have submitted that same value to the system. But it turns out that if you if you know what you want to look for, you can effectively use your OPRF or, or blind signature scheme and query the system for any value that exists in the system at all, mm. um, which I think is a problematic uh, characteristic of the, of the proposal. I think you've, you've talked about the, value, the, the fact that the inputs to the system have to be high entropy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, that's still not necessarily a, a defense against the, the attack where I, I wanna find out if, if people have visited a particular website. Um, and inputs of URLs, for instance, I can I can still say, oh, this particular URL here, I want to know whether that's entered the system mm -hmm. at all over even a, over a, over a given time period. And of course, those queries are destructive in the sense that you um, once you've seeded the the K values into the system, you're done. Um, you won't know whether other people have submitted any values into the system at that point necessarily, but you can you can still learn that they've put some value in there. So what do you, what do, you do about civil attacks effectively is the question. Let's see the last sentence again, sentence again Martin. What, what do you do about civil attacks on, on, the, on the system? Yeah, I think uh, we've been pretty explicit about the fact that we, yeah, like we don't really try to deal with civil attacks. I think the, yeah, the fact that it is vulnerable to um, like a, you know, like a, the fact that the server might try to query for a certain thing, as you mentioned, we the whole reason the random, randomness server exists is to provide some entropy around that. But you're right, the attack still still exists. Um, I'm not sure if we've. Uh, I think I think we have text around that, but but you're right, like it is. Yeah. The randomness server only ensures that you have to be online to make that that attack. It doesn't doesn't really change the the characteristics. You can't do an offline attack on it in the sense that you can't generate the values that go into the system without ha having access to the OPRF or the randomness server. Well, the randomness server also helps you, like if, you're, if your input space is, is limited, then uh, like it, that, like that's the main value okay. of it, right? So uh, in order to um, like kind of like provide randomness in that, 
like um, could you like maybe repeat that online so, offering part? So if if the values going into the system are chosen from a small space hmm. of, of potential things, and, and there's like five bat, five different options that people could submit into the system, it doesn't matter that you've got a, a randomness oh, server right. because I can simply just walk through all five values, submit k things, and and work out you know, work out exactly. Mm -hmm. How many other people have, right. have submitted those those each of those values? Mm -hmm. So if if you haven't met the threshold, I can just ensure that you meet the threshold for any given input to the system. Um, I think Sophie is also in line to maybe respond to that, but I think the idea is also that we do an epoch rotation to help with that. Sophie, did you have something to respond? Yes, um, I'm not sure which one is the line, <laughs> but I will take this one. Um, so what you're talking about is the degree of leakage, right, that the scheme has. Um, so there's two things. Um, any K threshold aggregation scheme that exists in the literature will have a degree of leakage, unfortunately. Um, in this case, we use the randomness server just to um, locally have another entity to derive the randomness, but you can also have it locally, but with the same problem. One of the things that you can introduce is differential privacy at some point. So some of the values will look uh, random enough, so they will not be, um, or some of the values will indeed be random, so the attacker will not be able to launch that that much. Um, indeed, even the problem of the ciphertext, of a bad ciphertext, can be considered as differential privacy, and in that way, um, 211, minus some formalization that we need to do, and that to a level can stop that degree of leakage. So, so maybe like, let's take a step back here. First of all, it would be really helpful if you stop talking about the local data as randomness. It's not, um, and it's really unhelpful to look at that way. Like the local data is fixed, and the randomness, if anything, comes from the server. And that fact, the problem with the naive scheme is exactly that. So if you step back and look at the naive scheme, the one that's in Proclo, and that is, is in like star, simple star, which has the problem that you can offline exhaustively search all the mm -hmm. possible input, all input values as long as they come from a small space. The random server replaces that with having an online query for that space, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, and so um, it's actually a little worse than I think Martin was suggesting the way he was describing it, which is that um, I don't need to get to K at all. Like for any, any, any value I think may be in the set, I simply send it to the server, I get the tag, and I look to see if it's in the list, period, full stop. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the the, 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 the situation for which this is useful is one is for keys which are in a large in a, in a large enough space that is not that it is small enough space that does not that it is um, sorry in a, in a large enough space that it is not practical just to search the oracle mm -hmm. and in a small enough space that you need the oracle at all this right you need, need the appear at all right and so I think the question is like do we actually have a system of that type that namely how many systems do we have where the, you wish to query values from a client where essentially none of the, none of the client values are predictable because this, has a, because this is a very goofy set of privacy properties, which is that if you're, um, which is that like, if we want to capture say URLs, right? Some of those URLs will be, will be high entropy and will not be queried by the Oracle, but some of them will not. Mm -hmm. And so what guarantee we tell people if we collect say URLs and we say is like, well, if your URL is like Facebook, then you're hosed. But if your URL is like a Google doc, then you're cool. Like that's a very hard thing to explain to them. And so I think the question is like, what is the environment in which this is like, in which this is like a reasonable set of privacy properties? Yes, so I agree. Um, maybe later we can actually formalize it properly, but I took everything correctly. <laughs> um, but I agree that if there should be a section also at least on what kind of high entropy value should be. And also if we're going to be adding differential privacy, how it will work and how to a level it will stop any leakage. But later, I, I will fetch you to, to talk about it. <laughs> um, I guess Ben is next in queue. Hi. Uh, so first, I mean, uh, Eric, Eric just asked a, a question about about use cases that, that line up nicely with the properties of the system. Uh, if they, if anyone has a has a use case that they think you know highlights a, a good application star, um, I would also be interested to to hear about uh, how about that and how it lines up with the privacy property. I mean, we've uh, we've thought about like use cases in terms of like analytics, like in terms of uh, you know how many tabs does a does a 
does a user have open or um, that in combination with like what region they're from um, or what OS they're on, like that kind of stuff. Um, we've, that's like what we're shipping right now. I guess, why isn't that just Prio? I don't understand. Um, like why, don't you, why don't you do that with Prio? Because of the, the fact that it's like complicated and expensive for us to run. That's like the that's like the one of the main motivators for for Star. Hmm. I mean, I thought the point of Star was you're collecting arbitrary strings, but what you're collecting here is numbers. So maybe I'm just really confused. Oh, in the, oh, you mean I mean, like, we, like like most browsers just collect that data in telemetry directly without like even without even trying to pri pri privacy protect that, right? Uh, I said like most people just collect this data directly, right? You collect the the the, the demographic information, the clear, and then you have a counter, right? So like, I'm trying to like uh, work out what the use case is here. So you're saying most people collect uh, that kind of data in clear text? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're saying that that's a problem, and we shouldn't be collecting that sure. in clear text. But, but I mean, again, this is like what like this is like what Priya was for, right? This is precisely the use case Priya was designed for. Um, right, but like given that Star is cheaper and and, and faster, like it, like that's well, the, it's not. But is Star, Star in fact cheap? Is Star with VSS faster than Priya? Faster uh, than Poplar? For for certain K values, like like what Sophia showed, um, and like. Like the unverified uh, like part of star, which is like uh, a significant portion of our deployment, like that uh, it okay, is way faster. You and I have had this conversation before. Yes, but the fact that you've deployed it is like not really relevant here. The question is with the ITF standardizing protocol that has that has the properties we're describing, and so like I think in, in order to do that, you have to compare the verified version to Prio, not like the unverified version. Um. So so you're saying that. Star should only, we should only talk about verified and not about unverified, is that? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Um, I mean, I think I, from our point of view, the author's point of view, I think um, like we don't agree. <laughs> okay, think, sure. Yeah, um, because we found value in deploying the unverified uh, version of this as well, because for, for telemetry, like we, you know, um, if there is a bad batch, like we can just throw it and we have like application layer defenses. So that's not a deal breaker for us. Um, no. But that's not what you started out, I guess. Yeah, I guess we, this is a separate discussion. Yeah, I, I guess I guess I'm like I'm just trying to figure out like what the use case is because like you just described a use case that seems like Prio to me, not like Poplar. Okay, I guess I'm just going to repeat what I just said. So okay, yeah. So I'm not sure how to put myself in the queue. Sorry, I haven't downloaded the application. But one of the things that do come into my mind is coming in. I, I closed the queue already. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I will. Okay. In fact. Chris, do you need to say something to this? Uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, uh, with a question Ben asked about use cases. Um, one use case we've been thinking about is NEL. So you have um, domains and like network errors. Um, and uh, STAR would probably work. That's like a, it's, it's a heavy hitters sort of shaped problem. Um, uh, and STAR might be useful for that. Um, I don't know about like min entropy though. Like I don't know how much how much min entropy like the submission of you know a particular domain would have, but um, that's a discussion we could have. Cool. Thanks. Um, I mean, I think it, if the question is around use cases, I can ha I'm happy to like put together a document on use cases. I, like, I, it's surprising to me that that's the issue here. Um, yeah, like, because we I mean, like, yeah, I think there's, it's pretty clear that there's several use cases for this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think that it would be really interesting to see use cases that you think fit fit Star uh, better than they fit Prio or Papa. Um, so, sorry, just to clarify, I think it's use cases given that uh, all the other benefits around like performance and, and cost of deployment yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually not my question. My, my question I wanted to ask you was uh, specifically, do you imagine that access to the randomness server is effectively open or effectively access controlled uh, or somewhere in between? Um, I think it could be either, depending on the deployment and your specific threat model. Um, like we we have like application layer defenses. Like if um, you know, like, like a trivial one would be like just uh, IP denialist the the aggregation server. But um, but you can imagine that um, you can have like stuff around that. Um, 
but like one of the points that uh, around like having an epoch and the fact that these the OPRF key rotates is to prevent attacks against the aggregation server. Um, I don't know, does that help answer the question? So basically it's sure. up to the so, deployment. Uh, yeah, I just, in, in terms of, you know, your, your perspective, it, it sounds like you're, you're saying that you, you have some sort of soft access controls for abuse mm -hmm. prevention, right. that, that's sort of the, right. where you landed. Thanks. Yes. So the question the chairs are facing is one of, of adoption. And Ecker, your use case objections, do you think that they can be overcome? And are they actually objections to adopting the document? Well, I don't know if they could be overcome or I wouldn't have asked the question. It wasn't rhetorical. Um, yeah, I think the document should have a use case. I, th I do think that those documents should have a use case that like something else doesn't fulfill. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it does have plenty of use cases given the other performance and complexity considerations. But, but, uh, but once again, this is, because, this is because you decided you don't care about verifiability. Um, but I'm saying even with verifiability, like we have certain cases for which this does, does well, perform well. I mean, we, we, we can like, like draw a flow chart here, but the, but the underlying mm -hmm. problem right. here is that like for low entropy inputs, this is like not secure for the reason Martin was indicating. Because mm -hmm. you can just ask the Oracle for the values. Right. And so, um, and, and, um, so the question is, and for very high, and so the question is like, what are the inputs that have sufficiently high entropy to be safe to use in the scheme? Mm -hmm. And like the example you gave me, isn't one of them. The example you gave me of like the demographics plus number of tabs, there's like maybe 10,000 possible values. Um, so like, like the complete system is completely insecure in that case. Cause I'll just ask the Oracle for all 10,000 possi 10, possible values. And I'll just look them up. So it has to be something that has pretty high entropy, high enough that the Oracle is a real a real throttle. And so what I'm asking for is what is that system? Um, I think taking, taking a step back, I think, do we, so I guess you're saying that it's not worth adopting the draft and working on this as a working group until um, we come up with these, like. I mean, yeah, a couple would be nice, yeah. I mean, I don't think it has to be like, I mean, what I'm trying to understand is like, is like, is like why are we, is like, what motivates this work? And like, why is the ITS or why is the ITS deliver a protocol that does this? Especially since we've been quite a bit of time cabining what it can and can't be used for. And so I'd like to see a case where like this was this is obviously better than the systems we are currently working on. And if there is one, then great. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like it's like I think like like as I said in Zulip and like based on some presentation, I think it's quite likely that like this is faster than popular for like quite a number of situations, right? right. And the question is, um, because as I say, unless you have very high contamination rates, you're actually gonna only have to run approximately K, you know, K or two K or three K mm -hmm. verifications. So that seems like, assuming those numbers are right, which I have no reason they're not, that seems like a pretty persuasive argument. But the question is, are there input values that is useful? And so I think, that, and I, I mean, I don't know, but like, it seems like a, like an email or mailing list would be enough to answer this question. Say it last week again. It seems like an email or mailing list. I'm like not asking, I'm not asking for like an extensive document. I'm saying like, sure. can we have like two examples or three examples? Hmm. Roman, last word. Uh, hi, Roman, kind of as AD. I, I just wanted to opine on how to help uh, the chairs kind of figure out what to do next. I mean, what kind of strikes me here is we have one person coming to the mic saying, I want to hear more use cases. I don't see other people at the mic saying, no, no, like I'm good to go. I have not looked at kind of the mailing list to kind of check, but that, that that's a data point kind of for me. So we should hear if there are other voices that have opinions that like we're ready to go, let's hear them too. I think we did hear one. Uh, viewpoint about how there is a use case, right? I mean, specifically, Chris, I, think, Chris said that. I think we can have that discussion productively on the list. And being aware of the time, I think we should give Philip a chance to do his um, secure partitioning protocols presentation. Thank you, Sean. Cool. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for all the discussion on this. Hi. I requested slides. I'm not sure I got them. We'll be up in a minute.
All right. So you should I have slide control. Take... Yeah. So so I have the slides now. Thanks. So I want to take a step back from uh, concrete uh, protocols for aggregations. Hello. I can't hear the room at all. You cannot hear me well. Like this, maybe better. Better. Now. You sound good in the room. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I want to talk about something that's useful for many measurement protocols, and that is secure partitioning. So, the motivation for this is, again, statistics measurements and aggregate measurements, and we've heard protocols about that, something like DAP, or something that's discussed in other working groups is, uh, for example, this IPA protocol for secure, secure um ads measurement. So the general setting for these is we have lots and lots of clients, think billions, and then a couple of servers that perform some kind of multi-party computation, uh, computation to actually get the measurements. So the clients will upload their encrypted reports to, these, uh, to this MPC cluster. The MPC cluster will do some computation uh, within itself, and the result is then uh, given to some collector who gets the aggregate result. Now, the main question is, if we have only a couple of servers that uh, process the data from billions and billions of clients, um, that's going to run into some bottlenecks in terms of memory, in terms of computation, and so on. So what we would like to do is shard these MPC clusters. So we'd like to have many copies of these couple of servers that each operate on a subset of clients. Now, the issue is, how do we distribute reports across these shards? So how can we make sure that all of the shards that correspond to a certain client, if we want to uh, aggregate within a client, uh, end up in the same shard? And that is basically what I'm trying to solve with the protocols that I'm presenting here and that I would like to have a discussion in the working group or in the ITF about. So the goals of these protocols should be that the overhead is low. So we don't want to spend more work on the sharding than we're spending on the actual computation. So we, we're okay with a small factor overhead, but that should be a small factor. And same for round complexity. So having a protocol that takes 15 rounds for doing a shard, uh, sharding is maybe not worth it if we're then doing a two round uh, aggregation protocol. And finally, we don't want to affect uh, utility. So that is more a design choice. So maybe for some aggregation functions, it would be OK to affect utility. Um, but I think it's possible to do it without affecting utility. Um, that's why I think we should aim for that as well. And yeah, then some assumptions that I'm making is that we have a bound on the number of contributions per client. So we will have that to ensure differential privacy anyway. And many of the protocols being talked about want differential privacy eventually. And again, as I said before, we have billions of clients and a few thousand shards maybe. So that's also some, um, something that uh, needs to be considered. So the threat model, as with uh, DAP and other measurement protocols, we have non-colluding servers. And here I'm going to stick to two non-colluding servers. But you could also think about extending that to three or more. Um, and the par parties are assumed that they can misbehave arbitrarily, so malicious security, as long as we have at least one honest server. And the output of the partitioning protocol should be differentially private. So I'm quickly going to go into differential privacy, uh, the definition, just what it means in this particular two-server setting. But I think it's just a generalization of the general uh, DP definition. So in more detail, we have these many clients and the two servers. The, uh, the adversary is assumed to have access to one of the servers and as many clients as it wants. And with that, it's trying to analyze this view to learn something about a particular client. And now what differential privacy gives us is that uh, the probability of observing two views that change in a, one particular client is close to each other. And what close means uh, that is defined by these two privacy parameters, epsilon and delta. Now, the general blueprint of the partitioning protocols that I want to talk about follows this particular structure. So we have two servers. And the way that we assign clients or inputs to a particular shard is by means of an OPRF computation. So 
the client will upload its value and it has some kind of index that identifies the client and will also identify the shard. And then some payload that gets input into the uh, multi-party computation of the sharding. And it encrypts both of them where the encryption of the index is done in a particular way that allows the first server to homomorphically apply the OPRF. So in the semi honest setting, uh, Elgamal is what can be used here. In the malicious setting, there are different crypto systems like the Dodis Polsky crypto system that allow for homomorphic evaluation of an OPRF. So that is done by this first server. It can evaluate the, home, uh, the OPRF under the encryption given its private key K and also add some dummies. And the way it uh, adds these dummies is to ensure differential privacy of, of the output. It will then forward these encryptions after re-randomization to the second server. And the second server can decrypt, get the OPRF values, and from that it can assign uh, client inputs to a shard. So that's the general blueprint. And now the question is, how can we instantiate that um, for a particular setting? So the first I want to talk about is if we have an OPRF that directly maps client inputs to a particular shard ID. So let's say we have 1024 shards, so we have a 10-bit output OPRF. Um, in that case, the, the server one can actually add dummies to every single possible OPRF output because it can just enumerate all the possible OPRF uh, outputs and then generate dummies for each of those uh, buckets. After the second server gets the OPRF value, it will directly know which shard this particular input goes into. Right? So that means for each client, we have a shard fixed right in the beginning, and uh, server two just uh, assigns the shard to, the, to this particular value or encrypted value to this particular ciphertext. Um, the amount of noise that we need in that setting is actually quite low. So if we do the math and think about, okay, how much noise or how much random dummies does the uh, does server one have to add to, for each OPRF output, then you get to something like 49 or 50 M, where M is the maximum number of contributions that a single client has. And now if you think back that we have billions of clients and only a couple thousand of uh, inputs, then maybe uh, this is a very small overhead over the size of a shard that we have anyway. Um, one thing to note here, though, is that the size of the shard will, in fact, still reveal information to the, uh, to, to the other party. So that means um, once we release the size of a shard, uh, we have to make sure that at least one honest party added noise to this size. And so in particular, in this setting, this could be, mean that both servers have to add this amount of noise to, to that shard. Um, but yeah, so that's a very simple protocol that already allows you to distribute inputs to uh, shards that, oh, lost my slides, um, that only has one drawback, and that is in some settings, we might want to do some local pre-computation before doing the MPC uh, between the servers again. And that's the second partitioning protocol that I want to talk about, uh, what it addresses. It allows... Uh, the server who gets the partition, partitioning after assigning inputs to partitions to do some local aggregation. For example, uh, if you have a value that is encrypted under homomorphic encryption, you can do local addition before running the, um, the MPC. So that's what I want to call the sparse partitioning. And sparse because here the OPRF output is not a dense domain like 1 to 1024, but it could be something like 128-bit uh, identifiers. So we have large uh, OPRF outputs. The, same, the structure, other than that, remains the same. So again, we have the client encrypting under a certain crypto system their inputs to the first server, the first server obliviously evaluating the OPRF, and then the second server getting the output of the OPRF. Here now, there's a challenge in how do we add dummies, because we cannot just enumerate all the outputs of the OPRF and add a certain amount of dummies to each of them, because that would require far too much noise and probably has exponential running time. So um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be a bit more complicated how to add dummies to there. But we have a paper that was published in CCS last year that addresses exactly that problem. And that allows us to create these oblivious uh, sparse histograms. Um, and now the second server can perform a local aggregation. 
um, and then input whatever uh, gets output from this local uh, aggregation into the MPC. So one question here is now we don't have an we don't have a shard ID directly coming out of the OPRF because what we get out of the OPRF is this long pseudorandom string that is in general a pseudorandom identifier for a client. So how can now assign this to shards? And one approach that I'm proposing here is basically we just take shards of a fixed certain size, so of a capped size that does not reveal anything to uh, either server, the size of the shard. And then the server who learns the OPRF value is just, just going to fill up these, um, these shards with the ciphertext until it's full. And what do I mean by full is the number of ciphertexts we have divided by the number of shards rounded up. So once we reach that many um, ciphertext in a particular shard, we say, OK, that shard is full, and we start with the next one. And we can guarantee if we just have like a slight um, number of shards that we allow above the threshold, that is exactly the number of um, inputs that a client can contribute, contribute, then this allows us to distribute all of the inputs without any, um, any uh, inputs being left out. So one caveat with that is that we, we are at, while uh, we are we are over time for this session. Um, okay. So you have. A I'll last, finish up. Couple uh, last few words, but we are we are officially over time. Yes. So th that was basically the the content of my presentation. So I just want to uh, say that there's a slightly larger overhead with the sparse uh, protocol, and in general get some interest from the working group into uh, working on these kinds of protocols. Um, what other settings it might, that might be useful? So I don't know much about star, but maybe it might be useful there. And what other properties, for example, ordering of inputs we might want from partitioning protocols. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this presentation. Um, you know, as I said, we're we're over time, so I don't know that we can really uh, have a discussion about this. Uh, I would encourage everybody to also check out um, Philip's other presentations this week. Um, In Pair G, I'll try to go into more detail, given more time, maybe. <laughs> um, so if this if this uh, seemed interesting to you, then there's going to be more opportunities for you to get more details and uh, and ask questions. Thanks. OK. Thank you, everyone, for coming to PPM. And uh, see you on the list. Yeah. Oh, wait, okay. Right. And so this this only matters, you know, and this is like Uh, hey, <laughs> good, how are you? <laughs> to direct you, Maisie. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good, how are you? Freaking jet lag. Yeah. Really jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh,